I mean, the song is just such an absolute standard now, a classic, that to hear you reinterpret it and breathe this new energy into it, this new culture into it, is so much fun and so great. We had experimented with samba throughout our live shows for years. We did it with rhythm, we did it with uh, conga, which is now samba, and uh, live for loving you, get on your feet. So we knew that it would work because of its African base that we share. Uh, both Brazil and Cuba, where our original sounds came from in that song. So I'm glad you're you're enjoying it. It must have just been really fun. It must have been great to reconnect to it again. Re-singing songs, sometimes after three decades, some of them, like uh, Conga, which became Samba, was really uh, a joy. And especially fun for me, because I usually I'm with my band. I wanna, we did this in Brazil with Brazilian musicians, these amazing arrangements. And uh, it was a blast for me. You know, originally we were supposed to put this record out in 16 and 17, but I lost my mom right before I was going to go in to do the vocals and I just couldn't sing. So I said, the kind of joy that we want to put on this record, I'm not feeling right now. So it was really important for me to take the time to grieve and come back with the joy that I knew that my mom would have loved. She heard all the music before she passed and she was very excited about it. So it was, it was, uh, I enjoyed going to the studio every day and, and doing new takes on, on these classics. I don't know if funny is the word, but you know, it is kind of funny that, that when you go through things in your life that are so significantly impactful, that even when you have a desire to try and find your voice, it's not there for you. How long did it take you to, to, for it to come back, to reach that place where you knew you could make an album like this? It was well over a year and a half. Uh, just, I, I didn't want to wait so long that because I had been talking about the record already to my fans and, and I just needed to feel comfortable in going to that studio and know that uh, my mom was going to help me uh, in that endeavor, which she did eventually. But yeah, it took a long time. It was a very big loss for me and it was sudden because she was doing great and just some something happened because of a condition that she had for a long time and the medications she was on for it that caused her to have to go to the hospital. We fought for 33 days. I thought she was coming out of it, but at the end it was her time and uh, it was brutal. My sister and I were able to be with her every moment. So that was great. And I really made my mom happy throughout her life. I, I have no regrets. I spent as much time as I possibly could with her, but I wanted this record to be a joyful celebration, which is also why when we were going to release it last October and COVID happened, we thought, this is not a good moment. We were dealing with all these stresses worldwide. Then when we were going to release in February, then the George Floyd thing happened in the United States. And out of respect for the protests that were going on and the very necessary stepping up for justice, I also postponed it. But then that's what actually caused me to have it released on June the 12th with a song that's an ode to love and joy because I wanted to balance a lot of the negativity that we were feeling and the sadness and the fear because uh, music saved me in my life. It was cathartic for me as a child and helped me through my toughest moments. So if you're fortunate enough to have fans listening, that's uh, I wanted to put that joy out. I, I sort of wonder you know, how you found that balance and how, why you decided to, to fight for your rights and the rights of, of people in your community and what you believed in, but you decided to make it a joyful experience to get people to dance while they learned. My dad was a man that loved freedom and he was a very moral man. And he took me out of Cuba and brought me to the States because he was aware of what was gonna happen to the country. He was a police officer there. He wanted to be in the military and his dad didn't let him. He was, uh, my grandfather was a commander in the Cuban army and he didn't let him because he didn't wanna be accused of nepotism. And which was exactly the reason they were both jailed on the night of the revolution. Uh, my dad was at the presidential palace. So he took us out to raise us in freedom. And he was always a man that freedom was very important to him. So you won't hear a lot of politics in my music at all, but what you will hear is standing up for freedom of expression in songs like Oye Mi Canto, uh, the freedom of every human being to be who they are. Um, and the fact that music got me through my toughest moments. And I've celebrated the music of different countries throughout my career, but it's always something that is natural to me. For example, it's part of my vocabulary. Uh, when I did Mi Tierra, that was a totally roots Cuban-centric album, it came from 
the knowledge that I had of Cuba of the 40s and 50s because I learned these songs to sing for my grandmother and my mother. And I grew up listening to that. So when I wrote the album, Mi Tierra, I even knew the types of lyrics, how they were formed in that time. And the concept was to do new music that sounded like it had been around from the 40s. I've celebrated Caribbean music with Alma Caribeña, uh, Colombian music with Abriendo Puertas, Andean sounds with Unwrapped and Rap and Brazil that I've loved since I was a child and learned a lot of Brazilian tunes to sing in our early band days. So it's always part of who I am. Even if I go to the extreme of the Glory album that was all pure dance, still with that fusion of who I am, which is, you know, Cuban girl born and raised in Miami. Yeah, I spoke to James Taylor about the idea of working on an album of standards, an album of songs that, that he remembers from his childhood, songs that he was raised on that have a specific memory attached to him in terms of family, in terms of growth, and how approaching those songs was one of the most challenging experiences of his career because those songs mean so much to him and his family and are such an impactful part of his growth that putting his voice on them and trying to reinterpret them, it's like the stakes were even higher than following a hit record or anything of that nature. I can understand that because it happened to me when I did the standards record and when I do something like this uh, with this Brazil 305 likewise you know it, it was my own tunes that I was covering but I don't I don't want the fans to you know suddenly go oh wait a minute what is that and at the same time I love you know playing in a new field in a new you know fun way to express and yeah you always approach things with respect you know after several years of finally achieving the kind of success that miami sound machine had you had strove to try to get uh you swerved out um with your husband's support and and decided to go solo and um and and i've i gotta ask you and i'm sure many have before but perhaps the answer has changed over time why when it was it was moving at such a pace and then all of a sudden it's like you know what someone who's a shy individual is now going to make it all about it has to be all about you and that's an interesting decision it wasn't my decision i tried to fight that decision it was emilio's decision i joined his band miami sound machine was his band and at the time that he decided he decided that he wanted to add my name i was getting a lot of offers for example from placido domingo had asked me to sing on an album with him based on the life of Goya. And Emilio said to me, I'm putting your name up front. First of all, I'm the only original member left on stage. And he was going to stop because he wanted to be in control of what was going on with lighting and sound. And I would say, but why? We have a successful thing. It's Miami Sound Machine. Why do, why do I have to add my name? He goes, what's Placido going to put on the record? Placido sings with the girl from Miami Sound Machine? He said, no, you are the front man. People need to know who you are. And when we dropped the Miami Sound Machine was when he stopped performing on the stage, even though we kept the band was always called Miami Sound Machine. And the same guys played with me from 86 that joined the band at that point till now. I still have my band with me and I still call the Miami Sound Machine and they're credited with that. But it, I fought that tooth and nail. I did not want to, my name to be put out front. I didn't. What has been the foundation upon which you and Emilio have built such a strong and incredible union whilst so many others around you fall? Well, first of all, we fell in love with each other, the real people. We didn't meet already. It, it's a trap sometimes when you get together after you're well-known or something because they always have an image about you and that may not be the person. Even though we're very different, which is a good balance because we fill in each other's gaps. Uh, if we were both like me, we'd still be playing guitar on the couch in our old house, if we were both like him, we'd be dead of heart attacks. So it's like, it's a good yin and yang there. Um, but in the things that matter, in the priorities of life, in the values, uh, we're on the same page. We rarely differ in business or music or anything having to do with our family, even though we have different ways of thinking about a million things, but we rarely argue. And it really helps when there's no cause to argue when you constantly are breaking down a relationship uh, by having that kind of thing, it, it's tough. What are the values that really matter to you and to Emilio and to your family? Well, I can tell you, first of all, to be a positive force, both in the family, in our country, in our city, and wh whatever we touch, to be honest, to be true to our uh, musical thoughts, but also to be true to what's the right thing to do? Be honest, to 
try to be helpful at every moment and uh, try to be better, continue to grow and evolve to be positive forces uh, in the world and, and, and put out good energy. Emilio is the most motivational man I know. Uh, he gives everyone opportunities. We all really feel that everyone is the same and we give the same respect to everyone in our lives and our children have grown up seeing it. We didn't have to tell them that because we are friends down from presidents and kings to the homeless people that we talk to every day when we're on our daily walk and that we have conversations with and that we try to help in whatever way we can. And it's not a matter of saying to your kids, this is what you have to do. It's what they see you do. And it's been important for us every step of the way to every step of the way to make the decisions that are going to carry us forward and that we feel that our family will be proud of us. One of the arguments on the front line of this political fight is how does America relate to its immigrant immigrant population and how does it grow given that the country was built in a large way by that population? You know, I look at things at this point in my life that have been around for six decades, over six decades, and I've had the opportunity to view uh, different governments and different, you know, I've traveled the world, I've seen a lot of different things. I have no doubt that the people of the United States are very fair-minded and support immigrants and support the racial injustices like to be, that have to be protected and moved to another level because I saw it in the 60s. I had a father who was in the army in Vietnam and I was watching the protests of the Vietnam War, which I also agreed with, but I had to balance the fact that my father thought he was doing something to help this country. We know now that the things that go on in the you know seats of government are very complex and sometimes secret and really stupid sometimes, quite honestly. But we tend to hear the extreme. The extremes are what come to the forefront, much more so now that everyone has a platform to be able to voice these kinds of things. So I have no doubt that the country is very still on that path and is on the right path. Unfortunately, government has gone a certain way where we are polarized. A two party system to me is completely outdated. Emilio and I are not affiliated. We have been for years. I think that there's a danger in following a party line in any case. We need human beings that can stand up and do the right thing. So I wonder sort of how you sort of feel about about where things are at right now because you're about to release a record in the most unorthodox manner that you possibly could. Yes, this is definitely our world war. It's just a silent killer. You can't see where the, you know, shots are being fired from. So it's a it's a very strange thing, but at least we have tools like this, uh not like 1918 when they had that horrendous uh <laughs> pandemic that took 50 million people in two years. So we still have to latch onto the good things. The good news is that since this album was slated for a previous release, I was able to go to Brazil. We were there a month and we shot a documentary about the roots of Samba, because for me, it is far more than just taking my music and creating these rhythms. I've, you know, studied the artists that I've loved. I've, you know, wondered where these things came from. And I learned so much by going down there. Um, the first single that we did, Cuando Hay Amor, we shot the video on the banks of the Abate Lake, which is where Samba was born, literally, from these Bayanas, these women. It came from women, Samba. Yet later on, they weren't a allowed or accepted in the samba world because it was viewed very dangerous for them to be out in the streets in carnival and what it had grown into. So um, we, I was able to interview uh, Monarca, who was a gentleman who's already in his 80s, and he established Portela, the, the second largest samba school there. I interviewed him and all his, uh, the people that, percussionists and people that were with him a part of this creation of this amazing thing. And they would break into song in the middle of the interview. It was really, it was wild. It was so good. I interviewed Alcione, the first woman that was accepted into Samba that created uh, the biggest hits for a woman the first time of anyone that was able to do Samba. I interviewed Maria Rita, the daughter of Elise Regina, who is 
close to sainthood down there. She died very young. Likewise, Clara Nunes died a year later. These women were the first women that were also accepted in the samba world. And to me, it's very interesting how even though the music came from women, because these Bayanas would improvise songs as they were washing clothes on the banks of that lake, particularly in Bahia, and then suddenly they were taken away. Uh, I learned of how the government of Brazil tried to silence the slaves from, or thought they were stopping them from uniting or being able to come together by outlawing the instruments to play sambas. And then they just moved to their backyards and created Samba de Mesa, Samba de Roda. So we were able to capture that in that documentary, which will eventually be released.